Let's just go into the word, can we? I... Father, we thank you for this day together with you in your house. I thank you, Lord, to be with your people, a blessed and victorious, anointed, overcoming people as you have ordained us to be. And Lord, we count it an extreme privilege and honor to gather in your house, to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth without any fear or infringement upon us. And Father, right now, we just ask that as we look at what your word says, that we absorb it and that we attain it, retain it, and then apply it like never before. And help me to deliver your word to your people in Jesus' name. And we all say amen. amen. And amen and amen. And, and you may be seated. And we're going to start in um, the book, book of Proverbs. You don't have to turn there. We'll quote it. I know you have it memorized by now. If you want to turn there, you can definitely turn there. You are more than welcome to turn there. Oh, there's such a wonderful atmosphere here, is there not? Wow. My. Uh, Proverbs 18.21, which we've been looking at this topic about the power of the tongue, the importance of it, I mean, the, the imperativeness of making sure that, that we are speaking what God says, what God's word declares, right? And, and I know it's difficult at times, to not speak the problem or to not speak the dilemma or the setback or the bad news. And, 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 and we do, and I, hopefully I've, I've made it clear enough in the past, it's not that we can never say anything bad as far as, okay, this is what has happened in someone's life. Uh, it, we, there again, that, that Scientology, Christian scientists say that don't ever even say anything bad because that even creates and augments the, the problem. And there's a sliver of truth in that, is that at the same time, how in the world can someone be healed or, or, or set free from a case in their life if they don't acknowledge that and verbalize that? Coming all the way back to salvation, if people think that they don't need to be saved or that, you know, I don't, I don't even want to acknowledge that and and uh, that way it'll keep me out of hell. I mean, it, it, it's ludicrous of a, of a thought process, but some people almost go to that degree. And then you get Christians, they'll, they'll get a few sound bites of uh, developing and understanding the power of the tongue, and, you know, and having a, a, a faith, instead of positive confession, I like to refer to it as a biblically-based confession, a faith-filled confession. Um, so they get little sound bites of it, and then, you know, they, they, they won't say anything bad at all, such as, hey, this person's going through a difficult time. We need to pray for them. Oh, I rebuke that. Don't say they're going through a difficult time. Well, how in the world, how in the world can we help them through prayer and help that individual? You know, it's just like someone who, uh, they're, again, they're going through a difficult time, whatever that difficult time is. They don't even tell anybody. It's like, no, everything's wonderful. Well, I, I see where you're coming from to a degree in, in, with, with your stance of faith. That's good. But at the same time, if you don't acknowledge that to the degree is that you're, you're not acknowledging that that's going to get the best of you. You're acknowledging that faith in God, prayer found in God's word, coupled with his promises is going to get you out of that situation, whatever that is. Right? So there, there, there is that understanding. I'm sure we, we have that now by all means, but, um, it, it's, it, it's apparent that we, we understand that balance. Uh, but the, the imbalance is where people, they just, they just simply focus and talk on all the negativity, all the dilemmas, all the heartache, all the regressions, all the problems, and, and they don't even, don't even spend time praying about it. So that's that balance there, right? And I know we have that, but just kind of, just want to clarify that one more time. Um, because in James chapter 3, well, there again, go, go ahead and turn to James chapter 3, but there again, in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen? Amen. So our tongues create either that which is good and wholesome and pleasant, or it creates that which is, that which is dark and that, that which is uh, debilitating, that which can even be 
uh, destructive, that which can be hurtful and painful, that which can actually cause someone uh, to, have, to have a destiny that's filled with destruction just because of the destructive words that they speak over others or even themselves. You've seen it, I've seen it over the decades. So that's what we're really referring to is we need to make sure we're not speaking death over ourselves, death over people. Someone would say, I'd never do that. Well, anytime, anytime someone speaks uh, in a demeaning manner, not necessarily just to the person, but a demeaning manner overall by saying this, you know, uh, oh, you'll, you'll never get that job, you'll, you'll, you'll never accomplish that, et cetera. That's a demeaning mannerism of, of verbalization. Uh, so anytime that's being done, that's literally bringing death to that person. I mean, it brings death to their hope. It brings death to their faith even. It, can it be resurrected? Absolutely. But sometimes it takes a long time. I brought this out as that it's, it's been proven. Of course, the Bible makes it clear. So not that we have to have clinical psychologists to prove what the Bible says is true, but it's been proven in the, the realm of psychology is that verbal abuse can be as destructive as physical abuse and even sexual abuse. And that, vi that verbal abuse, man, it, it can literally destroy people's lives. And James makes that very clear in James chapter three. So there again, death and life from the power of the tongue, we're, we're aware of that. So let, let's go a little bit deeper on this today, can we? So James chapter three, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a, oh, where am I? I'm, I'm in the wrong I'm, I'm in the wrong place. I, fin I was reading this before, I was reading another book of the book because I got sidetracked this morning going, wow, that is so good. I for oh, forgot how powerful that is. Uh, James chapter three, uh, brethren, let us not be many masters, knowing we shall receive a greater condemnation or greater judgment. Laugh now, I got that one memorized, huh? Verse two, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, focus on that, which though they be extremely great, they're driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm wherever the governor or the pilot of that ship desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire Kindleth. And notice this, verse 6, and the tongue, it's a fire, it's a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and set on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. That's how destructive the tongue can be. Little, little things, innuendos, sometimes things, not even words, but certain things that can flow from us, it can literally cause some destruction be it small, be it almost uh, inconsequential in some regards, but still it's like, oh, that was a barb. And then it can be to destruct to the point where again, that verbal abuse, that, that verbal casting of your destiny is never going to be full and, and brought to fruition and enjoyable and blessed and all of that. So the Bible, it goes on to make it clear in James chapter three, that no man can tame the tongue that no one can tame the tongue. So here's what's interesting. See, if we just look at that for, for that, that specific blunt point, if you will, I should say actually that surgical uh, maneuver with a scalpel, is that we would say, well, pff, we, no one can tame the tongue. The Bible says that, so I'm gonna give up. No, the Bible says that the tongue no man can tame. Continue to read on down in James chapter three. But it doesn't say the Holy Spirit can't tame our tongue. It doesn't say Jesus Christ can't tame our tongue and sanctify our tongue. The Bible doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, it's the Holy Spirit that will tame. He's the only one that can tame our tongue. Jesus Christ, when we get born again, he, he saved our body, soul, and spirit. He saved everything about us. And sometimes my, 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 my tongue still backslides. And a lot of people say, oh, you use profanity. That, that's not the issue. I don't. But the thing about it is, sometimes like, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't even implied it. I shouldn't even inferred it. And, and uh, I'm sure I'm the only one that's ever dealt with that. So, so I, I realized that almost every day, every day, David prayed this. I think he prayed it every day. He didn't say that in the Bible. In the book of Psalms, he said, Lord, put a garrison, put a watch over my mouth. And uh, I realized sometimes, oh, I, I need to keep praying that on a more regular basis. I've slacked off on praying that. 
So, you know, we can't get to the point where, you know, we're, you know, we, we become so stoical, we don't even talk. How you doing? You know, so we, 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 you gotta be you. Turn to somebody, you gotta be you, you know, you were, you know, and, and that's why, you know, let me, let me just share this here. Uh, you know, I think most of you know this, but hopefully you, you since, is that, um, and this is how I see you guys. This is how I see you guys. And stay with me on this. You, you couldn't say anything that would offend me. You couldn't. Two reasons why. First of all, I know your heart. There's no malice in you toward me. <laughs> I, I, I know that. I, I know you're, you're, you're still in deep consternation, in deep rumination, right? I know that. I'll get to you early, brother. I'll get to you later, brother. So, so uh, no, he ain't in trouble. It's just he, he, he did his homework. But anyway, um, uh, so, so I know there's no malice in your heart. So even if you say things sometimes, some of you have said something and later, be it later in the day you've called or text or, or like the next week, say, you know what? I just want to make this clear. You know, I didn't mean it that. And I, and I go, oh, I, I appreciate your sensitivity. I really do. I didn't take it that way. And because, you know, you, you know when someone, you know when someone's digging you or throwing a barb at you. And, you, and then you know when it's just a little banter, you know? And, and, and I know you have no malice in my heart, and hopefully you know I have none in my heart for any of you. Amen. Hopefully you know that. Amen. Now, just because I'm made in certain regards, you know, there, there's sometimes that banter, and, and this is why I can't be offended, and I know you're just like this, because I know there's no malice in your heart toward me, you know there's none in my heart toward you. And another thing is, I'm mature. Amen. It's like, Amen. and I, I, got, I got real thick skin even regardless, you know? There are three qualifications to be in the ministry. That is, you have to have the heart of a child, the mind of a scholar, and the hide of a rhinoceros. So you better have some thick skin if you're going to be in ministry, amen? And, and the thing about it is, if you're going to accomplish anything in life, you better develop some thick skin. You can't always think, oh, they slighted me, or oh, they offended me, or oh, did you hear that? Oh, did you hear It's like, it's all right. Turn around, it's all right. It's all right. And then, then at the same time, you know, it, 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 it gives that lateral levity if, you know, that it's, hey, I know they're hard. It's like, yeah, I didn't take offense to that whatsoever. And then, you know, I'll always hope that's reciprocated because it, it always is sometimes. And um, anyway, where are we at? So the Holy Spirit can tame our tongue. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right? So, but back to this. Here's what I want to focus on. Uh, just review real quickly last week. Of course, you know, if you didn't, if you weren't here last week or you didn't catch on the YouTube channel, uh, we, we, we talked and I talked at length. I didn't plan on it about um, the importance of making sure that, that, that you're sharing faith-filled conversations with people of God and even those who aren't Christians so that, that they can become a Christian. I learned this decades and decades and decades and decades ago, and I've been applying it ever since, and I've been looked at as crazy many times. My wife has applied this in so, so many different ways, and that is uh, talk to unsaved people like they're already saved. Amen. Talk to them like they're already saved. Now, first, they're going to kind of think you're crazy. Simultaneously, they're going to say, what do they mean by that? What does that mean? Where are they? So, but anyway... And, you know, I, and I paused. I mentioned this earlier, but I was just so caught up in the spiritual moment earlier. Is I mentioned my wife. Today is her birthday, and uh, today, on the Lord's day, now, a a gift from God to this world, and and to all who know her, and especially me. That was. Um, you know, that was, I, I gave her a song. I said, you know, th this is your song. Everyone has to have a song. I, my, my children will have songs and my grandchildren have songs and ev everyone needs a song. You know, it's like th this who speaks, th this song speaks of you. It, you're in this song, as a matter of fact. Um, so, and the, the, it's your song. Um, and I used to sing it to her off key and, but in love, it sounds good, you know. <laughs> And uh, especially the one line that says, how wonderful life is. Yes. Um, 
while you're in the world. Um, so, um, and I digress and, and I'm glad I did. But anyway, happy birthday, my love. So wonderful lady, wonderful lady and uh, has made my life so much better. And I thank God that you are in it. And um, well, let's just take an offering and go home now. We're just good. We're just good. Um, look at this. Let's focus on this. Maybe I can do this some justice. But when last week we were talking about, we got into the book of James, uh, chapter three, verse four, especially that our tongue controls the, our very course of nature. And the ship here in James chapter three, verse four, it's, it's used as a metaphor for our tongue, specifically, which actually the ship is used as a metaphor for our life. And uh, the rudder, helm in the King James Version, same thing, just different uh, decades, different centuries of usage of that word. And, and helm being, and rudder being uh, the metaphor, the spiritual metaphor for our, our tongue. And James makes it clear that that rudder is extremely small, but it'll turn that whole ship. And that's why eventually he talks about even, you know, so the tongue that, that it can set on fire course of, of, of nature, meaning it can set on, it can destroy our destiny if, if used improperly because death there again is also in the, the power of the tongue brings that about, does it not? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So that's what James is, is con, con, you know, basically contrasting. Uh, and we talked last week about the, the importance of making sure that what we're saying about ourselves and about others especially those of the household of faith, that listen, listen, your destiny, your ship, it's gonna, it's gonna safely reach the harbor. You're, you're gonna fulfill your God-given destiny and within your God-given destiny, you will fulfill your purpose, amen? amen. amen. So it takes one with the other. So uh, we understood that. We talked about just real quickly about, uh, I came across this, uh, I was interesting, that, that word co-rumination, we begin to break that down because previously I mentioned about meditate on the things of the Lord. All throughout the Old Testament, also mentioned the New Testament, that word meditate, it meant several things, and one of the definitive words is ruminate, which ruminate, of course, as you know, remember, it means to think. What, what does it mean? Brother, Brother Alan Larson, tell me, what does it mean? It means... Absolutely, A plus. Everyone get that? Because he texted me, text me earlier in the week, and you know he mentioned that word that wow. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm so glad, I'm so glad uh, he paid attention and people pay attention. And I said this, and and half jokingly but half truth, is that man you re and he mentioned a couple other things that I said last week, and I said man you remember more what I said than I than I do. Because a lot of times I, I go home and uh, be it my wife or one, you know, or, or one of the children, they'll say something and, and, uh, and that I said, and I said, I said that? And I said, wow, that was, that's pretty good. I didn't know I said that. Because I only remember the bad stuff I said, you know, it's like, but anyway, so you, we, you ruminate on something when you're meditating on something, you meditate, because remember, book of Psalms, let the words of my mouth, meditation, my heart, because our, 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 our words are flowing from our heart. Because out of the abundance of the, the, mouth, the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So as we're, if our heart is meditating on the right things, our heart is ruminating, it's continually in deep consternation, it's pondering things, it's, it, it's plumbing the depths of God's word and, and his nature and his character even. And as we think upon that, it's easy to speak words of faith and words of victory and words of power and words of love and words of healing and restoration, is it not? Yes. So that's where we come from because there's this, there's an acronym, as it, uh, R-O-G-D, uh, Rapid Onset of Gender Dysphoria. And what sociologists and even psychologists have discovered, how that's occurring, this, because, you know, people are just going crazy about the, 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 tra the, the trans thing. And it just, it, it's, it's just flooding the school system. It's flooding elementary school, junior high, high school, of course, college age, and, and even those in their 20s, 30s, et cetera. And, and it's been proven because this co-rumination, meaning those individuals who are seeking others who validate and continually speak 
that ideology, that twisted form of morphing into something that you could never be to begin with, or in, I should say endeavoring to morph into something that you could never be to begin with. And, and, and the reason why it, it, it's, it's this widespread mass hysteria in many regards is because there's so much talk about it and it reaffirms the diabolical. So I just brought that in. I said, how much more should we ruminate and co-ruminate the word of God with each other like never before? How much more? How much more? How much more should we validate each other in Christ? How much more should we bless each other in Christ? How much more should we say, hey, you can change into the greater image of the Son of God more than you can ever imagine? Now that's a transition. That's a spiritual transition right there. So when we are co-ruminate, turn to somebody and say, let's co-ruminate over these good things. As we co-ruminate over the blessings of God, the power of God, the love of God, the healing virtue of Christ, your God-given destiny, something greater than you can imagine that God's planned for you. As you're co-ruminating over this, how much are we going to be conformed into the image of the Son of the living God like never before? Like never before. So let, 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 let's look at this. I just want to make this clear. When, you know, when I use that term, uh, metaphor, that, that doesn't diminish the, the authenticity, the, the inerrancy of Scripture whatsoever. Just, you know, there are a lot of Pauline metaphors. So in the Pauline epistle, he used, there again, different metaphors. Uh, how about uh, you're a soldier? You know, we, we are soldiers, right? Uh, also, also, you have... Um, the weapons of warfare, they're not carnal, so we, you know, we, got, we got weapons, spiritual weapons, but he uses the word weapons in a metaphorical sense for the, to explain the spiritual. That's what really parables are in, in many regards, what Christ said. So it, it doesn't minimize the spiritual truth, it just helps us to uh, understand more fully uh, with the elaboration. So there again, when James says, okay, it's kind of like, like our life here, as you behold those ships, because you're a ship. A ship has a destination. And a ship has precious cargo. You know, the cargo that you carry is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are carriers and couriers of Christ. Let me quantify that scripturally. When Paul says you are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador, as we all know, represents the king and kingdom he or she was sent from. And so they carry and they curry the very message and personhood of the king and the kingdom from which we, they were sent from. So there again, you and I, we are carriers of Christ, the presence of Christ, the words of Christ, the word of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you are carriers of that. That's why in the book of Isaiah, God declares, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. So we are vessels of the Lord, and when Paul uses that metaphor and the spiritual implication there is that, uh, for we have this treasure in this earthen vessel. So, so we, we are the earthen vessel, but there's a treasure within us. See, so you're a carrier of that treasure. And he goes on to define what the treasure is. There again, we're the earthen vessel. You know, bottom line, end of it all, <coughs> excuse me, we're just a piece of dirt. That, that's been touched by the glory of God with Christ resonating on the inside of us. So, now, that, now that's a transformation. So, but, we, but uh, we being the earthen vessel, we have this treasure in our earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So Paul makes it very clear, we're carrying something that speaks of the excellency of God Oh, let that one sink in. We, we, we need five years to just really dissect that one. So you are carrying on the inside of you the excellency of God. And you curry that to a lost and dying world. We even curry that to each other. So we come here every Sunday. We meet during the week, whatever, be it over coffee, whatever, refreshments or eat a meal or whatever. You're, you're currying the excellency of of God 
within you to other people. And that the power may be of God and not of us. So the power resides in you. It's, the, it's God's power on the inside of you. Because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world, right? So the bottom line is we are also, we are also carrying this, this precious cargo and maneuvering through waters. And they're not always still, are they? So, so we as a, a ship, just as a ship, you know, goes on a journey, when it leaves its port, it has a destination in mind. So the moment you got saved, you left the port of the world. You, you shoved off and said, I'm out of here. I'm on a destination and my port, my port, that harbor that I'm going to reach eventually is heaven. So between now and then, though, we're like a ship that's headed to, and we know where we're going, right? So at the same time, this ship called our, our life, it's turned about with this little member called our tongue. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help guide us and steer us where we need to go in conjunction with God's word within us that we carry and curry and speak. Because there again, when ambassadors go to another country, they can only speak the authority of the, what they've been given. And every, every U.S. ambassador, when they go to a foreign country, they are briefed and like never before, and in their manuals, their manuscripts, they, they are told, okay, if you forget, you, here, here, here are your parameters. You stay within this, you'll be fine. Don't divulge anything. You can't make any final decisions in this regard, bam, bam. Up to this point, you have authority. Outside of that, you don't have it. So, so it is with us. So, so as, 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 as our, our ship has been loaded down with the excellency of God, now we're going to steer this thing with our tongue. And we're going to steer it in the right direction, amen? amen? Because we want to make sure that what God has given unto us, it reaches safe harbor, right? So just real quick, I got a couple minutes now. Yes, How do we steer the ship in the right direction? So there again, if James chapter 3, verse 4, makes it very clear that, look, our tongue... Liken it unto the rudder of a ship can steer that big old ship. Our tongue can steer our big old life and our big destiny, right? How do we steer the ship in the right direction? First and foremost, here's what we got. Realize that you are on a ship. I know that's a biggie. It'll get deeper as we go, believe me. But anyway, you just got to realize you're on a ship. And I kind of already set all that up, so I don't want to be redundant and say it all again. But bottom line, your, your life... Your destiny is likened unto that which is going from one port to a final destination. So you are carrying that very cargo that God has deposited in your life and entrusted you with. And every day of your life, you are an ambassador. You are a representative of Christ, a representative of God. And from that, uh, it's always good to be reminded we're, we're on a ship. And not that we live in fear, but at the same time, we, we need to realize, you know what? This ship, it, 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 it could sink. Now, is it going to? No, because we're going to stay close to God. We're going to live for Jesus all the days of our life. And we're not going to, when I mean sink, it's the word of God all said it. We're not going to shipwreck the faith. We're not going to shipwreck the faith. Uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul used that very, that very word when he uses shipwreck, the faith. Um, yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 1, it's verse 19. Uh, verse 18, he, he, he's talking to a young apostle by the name of Timotheus when he says this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing this unto you and the church as a whole, but to you specifically right now that you might know how to war good warfare. So see there again, a metaphor, but... Timothy, you need to understand, this is war. We're in a warfare here. And uh, so th then he goes on to say, uh, having faith and a good conscience. It's like, yeah, we better have that. You lose that, you lose everything. It, 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 it's real easy why the world has gone mad in conjunction with the madness, the madness of crowds in our nation. It's because they have no conscience. One of the signs of the last time, Paul also prophesied this, that their conscience will be seared with a hot iron. So that we are in those days. There's, there's absolutely no conscience whatsoever. But anyway, with, with the masses that is. But anyway, so he said, having faith and a good conscience, which some have erred and have even left it. He goes on to say, and have shipwrecked the faith. 
So he makes it very clear in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that some have shipwrecked the faith. That, that's, verse, uh, that's verse 19, uh, if you want to fact check me on that. But anyway, so he says, he says that, and then he mentions the names of some of them. Hymenaeus and Alexander. So he just pulls off the gloves. And, and, and over the course, especially the last several years, you know, people said, They've come up to me, and, and some have even left. They said, you know, you, you shouldn't say that about other pastors. Oh, I said, oh, the ones that are preaching heresy? I said, you ever read your Bible? You ever read the Old Testament? You ever read the New Testament? Many of them have been named. Paul mentions him on, uh, he mentions Alexander uh, two other times. Initially, you, you find that in Acts chapter 19. You also see the reference again, if not specific name, but of course, connecting them together again. Uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, and also in 2 Timothy. Paul mentions other people who, who did him, not just did him wrong, but literally became an apostate. And that's what he's saying about here in first, back to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse uh, uh, 20, is that Hymenaeus and Alexander, they shipwrecked their own faith, meaning they basically, they became heretics and they apostatized. And in conjunction with that, and you can do a research on your own with, about them, is that they shipwreck the faith of others. That's why I, I think it's my responsibility. When I know, uh, when I know of pseudo pastors who are teaching and preaching heresy, they've not only shipwrecked their faith, it's like if you want to shipwreck your faith, that's up to you. But when you start shipwrecking the faith of tens upon tens of thousands of people, I'm going to stand up and say something. I don't care. People can call me hater or, oh, he's just jealous because he ain't got that many people in the church. It has nothing to do with it. And no, I'm not the moral authority. God hasn't made me judge and jury here on this earth pertaining to them. God will take care of that. But at the same time, the Bible makes it clear that false teachers in the last days, they'll become worse and worse. And it is a moral responsibility, it is a spiritual responsibility for men and women of God that have any voice at all to let people know, listen, they shipwreck the faith. And they will shipwreck your faith if you keep listening and keep joining yourself to them. And you just go down the list. And they package it up in different ways. It's been around for millenniums. You know, uh, uh, liberation theology. You know, that, that really came to the forefront about 40 years ago. Uh, you know, you have replacement theology, you have, you have all these things. And what's interesting, they tag as a suffix of a title, they tag the word theology to it. It ain't, it ain't theology. Theology is the study of God. So when it's heresy, you can't call it the study of God. When it's replacement, you can't call it theology. When it's liberation, you use the word liberation, which is, which is founded, it's so clear. The root of it is Marxism 101. It's also what I call, a, it's a socialistic gospel. And so many churches in America have been preaching it. You know, churches in, of course, socialist countries and Marxist countries, they, they, they've been, quote unquote, preaching. It shipwrecks the faith. It's, it's heresy, it's heretical teachings. And to me, someone should stand up and declare that, hey, hey that, that'll eventually lead you to hell. Because Mark, Karl Marx is their God. Karl Marx and Joseph Engels are their God and their Savior. And that Communist Manifesto is their Bible. And they bow at that altar. And you study liberation theology long. I shouldn't, I don't want to call it theology, but just for clarity. Uh, it's like, wow, how could anyone believe this? And, and, and especially you, you, you read enough of it and you'll say, oh, oh. It's all right to ordain homosexuals. Oh, okay. It's all right to even, uh, uh, at, at time, for leaders in the church, even the church, to, um, if they like to, practice in pedophilia. And some of this stuff is passed off in so-called churches today in America and definitely other parts of the world. But I digress again. Take control of the ship. Next point. Take control of the ship. Take control of the ship. Don't let a Hymenaeus or an Alexander control your ship. Don't let liberation theology teaching control your ship. 
Don't let a socialistic form of gospel control your ship, which is not a gospel. It's another gospel. And Paul said, if anyone comes and preaches another gospel, let him be a curse. Let him be anathema, anathema, actually, in the literal translation there. Let him be doubly cursed. That's why it's serious stuff. It's strong stuff, you know. And a lot of people really don't want to hear it. We want to hear the good ship lollipop. No pun intended there, but we want to hear the good ship lollipop stuff. Hey, and I do too. I like that too. I, I like to sing good ship lollipop and just skip along, you know. I like that too in life when we have those seasons. But, but that's not the real world. And especially the world we're in, the world that's endeavoring to try to collapse in upon us. Like never before, we need to take control of the ship. You take control of the narrative. You take control of your destiny. You take control and be responsible for what you are hearing, what you are reading, what you are applying, what you are practicing, and what you are living. You take control of the ship. Don't let people steer you around. And Paul there again, he admonishes us that don't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We got every wind of doctrine imaginable, imaginable. And I know it's, it's not your full responsibility to spend time and find out, Lord, is this, is this, or is this, you know, or, 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 or to do the research on it. That, that's pretty much my responsibility. It doesn't alleviate your responsibility to know what could lead you astray or not, but ultimately it's, it's for me to help God's people. And then you take it from there. And when the Bible says, listen, Try the spirits to see whether they are of God or not. If it isn't grounded and rooted in this, if you hear more about what this person said or this research said or this psychologist said or what this group said or what Karl Marx said, I've heard, I've heard pseudo-pastors quote Mao, Mao Zedong. Can you believe that? I've heard him quote Karl Marx, heard him quote portions of the, of the Communist Manifesto. And what's sad is the vast majority of Christians under their tutelage don't even know where it's coming from. But they go, oh, wow, that's so good. Oh, wow, that's so deep. He's, I wonder where he got that revelation. Oh, it's probably on the back nine when he was golfing yesterday. That's for sure where he got it. And I know my sarcasm sometimes isn't fully appreciated. I know that. But it, it, it's just, it, it, it's, but just take control of the ship. And I just got to that place, and I share this with my wife. We talk about this a, a lot, and, and my, my children, uh, and Rachel, my, my daughter-in-law, Joe, when he's home, and, and my son-in-law, we talk about it. I talk about it with many of you at, at times, is that, you know what? We can't, we, can't, we can't change everything out there, but let's make sure we're good. Yeah. Let's make sure we're rooted. Let's make sure we're grounded. Let's make sure we know what's going on out there. Let's make sure that we're standing on the watchtower of Almighty God and we see this thing coming. Let's make sure that we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let us make sure that we, having done all to stand, can stand therefore. We will stand against the enemy. We will stand against this tide of debauchery. We will stand against this tide of evilness. We will stand against the tide of lies and propaganda and gaslighting. We will stand against it. Because you're strong. You're stronger than you realize. Stronger than you realize. Just had a quick vision go through my mind about... I, I've always been fascinated, you know, maritime history and, you know, going all the way back to the, to, uh, of course, uh, you know, thousands of years BC. And uh, every, every ruler of a given nation, country, or portion of the world in ancient history, they, they eventually developed, they, they saw the need for uh, maritime defense, for Navy. And, you know, Solomon even did eventually. And, and uh, you know, built a lot of ships, and, and that was Israel's first navy, if you will, a thousand plus years uh, B.C. But, um, but anyway, um, especially, uh, you know, going back when you're a child, you, know, you read um, Treasure Island, you know, and you conjure up all these things. But, but um, the, the Spanish navy at one time was, was one of the, the biggest, most powerful navies in the world, in the, in the Probably for about, you know, approximately about 200 plus years, no one could compete with them. No one really wanted to mess with them. 
And, and when other nations saw any portion of the Spanish Armada coming in, they knew it was like, well, we better make peace because we can't beat these guys. Uh, so there again, for about approximately 200 years, they, they had the, the most uh, formidable uh, navy in, in the world, which, which eventually ended probably about, a little discrepancy, but probably um, mid, mid 1700s, but it was still strong then. Um, and so a lot of times people, they'll say, you know, they'll read a little bit and understand about all the ships that they had and all the silver and, all, and the trade routes and um, the trade routes that they kept secret even. Uh, and they, they allied, they got the Portuguese to allied with them and, and they, they hired just a bunch of pirates, hired a bunch of mercenaries and just a bunch of bad people too at the same time. And also the best, the best pilots, you know, those who could navigate those ships, huge ships throughout the world. And especially after Magellan, and he discovered some, some, some routes, and then uh, Amerigo Vespucci. So, so Spain, because they controlled the waters of the, of the world at that time, we're talking uh, uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century. And um, anyway, because some people say, oh, yeah, the Spanish Armada. But, well, the word, the word Armada means a naval fleet. It, it means a naval fleet that is filled with battleships and, a, and, a, and support ships. So just for what it's worth, you are an armada. You are an armada. You're a battleship. Like it or not, <laughs> aware of it or not, let me make you aware of it, you're a battleship. And the people around you are also those support battleships around you. That's why you need God's people in your life, amen? People know how to pray, people know the word of God, people are with you, not against you, et cetera, have no ulterior motives, no hidden agendas. Uh, can I help you with this? Here, 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 here's how, here's, here's what you look for in, in making a covenant ship, even, even a friendship. You really only make covenant ship and friendship with people who don't need anything from you. Because if they need something from you, eventually they're gonna stab you in the back. You, you come in covenant with God's people because a lot of Christians, they just want something from you. And same with people in the world especially. So you come into alliance with people, they don't need anything from you. So therefore, they're not gonna have any ulterior motives or hidden agendas to get that from you, what they need or want. They just, they just wanna be your friend. They just, they just wanna spend time with you and go through life with you for no other reason, no other reason at all. So, but anyway, so you got, got the Spanish Armada and, um, and all, I didn't mean to build all this up because there's this, there's this scene in the movie, I don't know if you ever saw it, called Elizabeth, uh, the Golden Age. Did you ever see that? Historically accurate, actually, because at this time, there again, Spanish controlled the, 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 the maritime regions of the, of, the ancient, of, that, of the world at that time. But England was coming up on their heels and England had a pretty decent navy, but not nearly as good as as the Spanish did. And Elizabeth, she's the queen toward the latter end of her reign. And, uh, you know, King Philip II, he's king over Spain. Bottom line, he's, try, he's, he's been sending spies and assassins to infiltrate into her court to try to kill her because, he wanted, because she was a Protestant. A, she protested against the edicts of the Vatican. And just for what it's worth, the Vatican was also given, given King Philip II money to hire assassins. Boy, isn't that, isn't, that a, isn't that really nice of that Roman Catholic Church to do that? But anyway, so the Vatican's paying, paying for assassins. The Vatican's paying to try to have Elizabeth overthrown, and she knew this the whole time, so she's in a precarious situation, you know, and not, not know who to trust and what should I do. But anyway, uh, King Philip's saying, you know, bottom line is we're, we're going to come after you, we're going to destroy you. And one of his emissaries is in her court basically telling her that. You remember that scene? And a little ugly Spaniard guy, and, and uh, he was, he was. And uh, so, man, she just came right back and just started telling him, you tell, you tell him, and blah, blah, blah. She goes, and then she says this. It's like, wow, that's so powerful. She says, I have a hurricane inside me. Yeah. Do you remember that line? Yeah. Oh, does that do something to you like it does to me? She says, I have a hurricane inside me, and everything it touches. They will be stripped of its existence, something like that. Amen. But that's controlling the ship. Yeah. Yeah. You ain't letting some spies on your ship. And if they want to go to war, you want to go to war. 
There is a hurricane on the inside of me. There is a hurricane on the inside of you. It's called the Holy Ghost. Why do you think it's called dynamo, dunamis in the Greek word? There is a dunamis. There again, it's a dynamo. And what that also refers, it literally does, it refers to, in the, in the extrapolated definitive phrases, that a violent wind, to be used, of course, not to destroy you, but to destroy that which is coming against you. Because remember, the Holy Spirit's also used as wind and air throughout, interchangeably through the Old Testament and the New. So you have a dynamo on the inside of you. You have a hurricane. Oh, would to God someone would get this right now. You have a hurricane on the inside of you. And let someone come and try to take your ship. Let somebody, because you know, you know, your ship is that which God has entrusted to you. So if you're married, that means your spouse. You have children, that means your children, because they're on the ship too. They're part of your armada. They're part of your armada. Just like children are arrows, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, they're also in this regard, how I look at it, and I've looked at it for decades like this, they're part of your armada. And that's why you gotta make sure their ship's in good working order too. And that's why you all need to stay together because armadas floated together. It's like, you're gonna come against one, you're gonna come against all. Oh, I know this is racist, but I still find it. Some, some would say, I, I mean, I shouldn't say that. So I know that some would say, oh, that's racist, but I find it humorous because it's the way it should be, actually. I grew up here, grew up in Peoria, and uh, went to Peoria grade school, you know, elementary, junior high, high school, and uh, the majority of my friends, they were Hispanic. And one thing I discovered about them is that you fight one, you're gonna fight the whole family. It's like, so, you know, you're, you're gonna fight Harvey, well, then you're going to fight Reuben. And you just got to work your way through the whole family. And then if you beat all them up, then their sisters are going to come gang up on you. So it's like, you're going to fight all of them. And the thing about it is, it's a spiritual principle. I'm not advocating that today whatsoever. And so, oh, that's racist. That ain't racist, it's the truth. And what I learned from that is that's how it should be. It's like, we're in this together. We are an armada going through life. And if someone in the armada is starting to go down, it's all hands on deck. We're going over there to help that ship in our armada get back up. So you see, each local church is an armada. This is an armada. Look, look around you. Look at all these ships floating around you. Some behind you, some beside you, some in front of you. This is an armada. And that's why you realize this, is that, is that we're battling the devil together. And if he's hitting someone over here, well, we're shifting over here to go help over here. And if we're hitting over there, well, then we're going to come over here and we're going to help over there. And we're going to take control of the situation. We ain't going to sit around and say, well, I wonder what's going to happen to them. Hell no. We're getting over there and we're saying we're in this thing together. There's a hurricane inside of me. Somebody say, there's a hurricane inside me. You got to release that thing every now and then. Let that hurricane destroy the demonic forces coming against you. That's the thing. You know what, what's the old saying? Actually, I heard this from my son James is that um, there are three things that everyone fears. Uh, I just narrowed it down to two. Which one of them is a raging storm in the middle of the sea. I don't know if you've ever been in the middle of the sea where you can't see anything but water and a little, a little something comes up. I don't care if you're on a 900 foot cruise ship and that thing kind of getting a little crazy here and there, you know, like Jesus, <laughs> just want to let you know <laughs> I'm on this ship. <laughs> so, so, but, um, but I mean, life is like that sometimes, isn't it? I mean, it almost turned you topsy-turvy if you're not careful. I said, just take control of the ship. Take control of it. And sometimes it's, it, it's, not, like, it's not like, okay, now we're going to commandeer your ship. No, we're just going to get on board with you. And we're going to get on your ship with you. And just for a while, this is your ship. But you know what? Let me, let me, let me just take control of it for a little bit. Let me shield you from some of this junk. 
Let me, let me buffer some of that junk. I, 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 can, I got some pretty big shoulders. I, I, I can take some of this off of you. So sometimes we need other people to say, hey, let me, let me, let me, let me get on your ship just for a little bit. I'm not saying you're doing it all wrong. I'm not, I, I just realize you need help. Let me, let, me, let me just come alongside you. Let me just jump over on your ship. Let me, just, let me just help a little bit. Someone's going through state of depression, you know, trying to, the enemy's trying to put major depression on them. Get on their ship. How do you do that? Go over their house, clean their house. Run errands for them. Of course, pray for them. Go over there and pray for them. Don't text them. Someone's going through a difficult time in their life, their health, relationships, whatever it is. You, you know, you know some, some say, you know, hey, they, they only want you to come so far. You know, just, 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 just get your ship close to mine. Just as long as I can see you there, I'm good. And that may be some people. That's kind of like me. I can relate to that. So whatever works. But bottom line is, we need to let other people know in this sojourn of life out in the seas that, hey, we're an armada. And we got to stay together. We got to fight the enemy together. Amen. Another thing, how to take control of and steer the ship in the right direction. Only let the right passengers on. Oh, we got to wrap this up. I'm going to have to make this quick. I'll make it quick so I don't get in trouble. I tell you what. You don't want the wrong people on your ship if they're the wrong people. You don't want them. You don't need them. I don't care how popular they are. I don't care how much money they make. I don't care if they have all the latest, greatest gadgets and cars and house and, and, and the wives wear the latest colors of Lululemon. And um, is that what that is? Lululemon? What's it called? Whatever it's called. My wife, she teaches me this stuff. You know, every scene that comes out there, I forgot. So I, it doesn't matter if, if the wife, you know, she wears all the latest colors and the husband, you know, he looks like he could, he could be in a commercial with, um, I don't know, creativity's gone right now, but anyway, so, but oh, they look the part, they, oh, you know, we want to get to know them, they're popular, they got, you know, they're the, I guarantee you this, they will be the first people to flake on your ship, and then some of them will try to sink your ship, some of them will literally try to sabotage your ship, some of them will actually even Start a mutiny. You know how many mutinies I have been through? I just pull out the famous saying of John Paul Jones. I have not yet begun to fight. You need to know the maritime story for that. He was one of the best, even up to this day, one of the best uh, admirals of our of the uh, the naval fleet, America's Revolutionary War. I mean, <laughs> gotta love this guy, right? Find a Revolutionary War because at this time England had the biggest navy in the world, biggest standing army in the world. And then we start this small skirmish called the American Revolution. We didn't even have a navy. We didn't have a standing army. Don't you just love that alone? The, the audacity of hope right there, you know? And um, so John Paul Jones, he, you know, we started building ships and he's basically, it was, it was a whaling vessel they converted into, overall, that's, that's what it was. It was a few things actually before that even, but one time it was a whaling vessel. And they put some cannons on it, made it a little bigger here, put some more sails on it. So he, he's, out, he's out there fighting the British and um, yeah, they're just getting, just getting slaughtered. Uh, the American Navy is... Uh, they're gonna, this is pretty much uh, mid, about midway through American Revolution, and um, they're sinking most most all of the the sailors under John Paul Jones' uh, command. Most all of them were dead now, and they'd even captured some. And now and now his ship's sinking. So that's when you know they're saying, "Hey, surrender! We want you to surrender and give up." That's when he said, "I have not yet begun to fight." You gotta love that. You have to love that. I mean, it's like, are you kidding? So then he jumps on their ship. And long story short, 
He beat them and he commandeered the British ship. I have not yet begun to fight. That should be a mantra of your life. See, isn't American history interesting? When you hear the truth about it, history as a whole is interesting, isn't it? But anyway, I say that sometimes. I've said that to the devil over decades. I've said it out loud to him. I want him to hear that. Screamed it at him a few times. Sometimes I told my wife that, children that, spoken that, and then sometimes, but I still mean it, but just with, with just a little bit of levity while, I'm, while we're eating, we're just talking back and forth. And I said, you know, here's one thing I just, just want to share with you guys. Just want to share this. I have not yet begun to fight <laughs> as we're eating lunch, you know, and it usually gets that response. But anyway, it reminds them that yes, yes. We say, well, I'd like to hang out with you. I'd embarrass you eventually. You probably wouldn't really like it. But anyway, I embarrass my wife and children all the time. And I love it. Don't embarrass my grandchildren. See, they're, they're too young to know. You see, they're going to reach that age in a few more years and say, Oh, Paul, don't, you know, don't do that. But, but you, you got to have the right passengers on. See, the right passengers on your ship, they'll love you regardless. Amen. They'll overlook issues because they have no malice in your heart because you, they know you have no malice in their heart. So we can all be on the ship and have great fellowship. No pun intended there. But everything could be fine. You're going to get along. And whatever comes, you're going to be victorious. Yeah. And you're going to say to each other, especially when the winds of adversity come at you. You're going to look at each other and say, there is a hurricane inside of me. And there is a hurricane inside of you. And in the midst of that fight, when it seems like you may be weary and it seems like you don't know if you can even stand anymore, you're going to look at each other and say, I have not yet begun to fight. We're just getting warmed up here. Just getting warmed up. Only let the right passengers on. People who love God with all their heart, mind, soul, strength, the body, love you, love your family, love everything about you. Overlook your idiosyncrasies, overlook your foibles, all that and so forth. But they have grace, they have grace in their life, and that grace causes them to overlook things, and, and vice versa. Vice versa. Let the right people on your ship. You know if they're right or not. How do you know? You'll know. You'll just know. You, can, you, you know it in your knower. You feel it in your spirit. Are these the right people? You, you, yeah, you know it. You just know it. And then in conjunction with that, the right people are the ones who are going to speak faith. When you're going through a battle, you don't want them to say, oh, oh, I don't have any wind in me left. <laughs> or, oh, I'm finished fighting. Nah. Nah. The right people on we filled with faith, filled with hope, filled with the word of God. Oh, let's go and stand up. We got it. It's time. Oh, God bless you for your patience. Here's how you steer it in the right direction. The last one is that you got to use God's word to steer the ship. What does God's word say? Hey, listen, sometimes unbeknownst to him, the enemy sneaks on board. He's a spy and he comes in and he, he begins to navigate our ship. Our, if it's not our ship, we're on, it's, it's our armada. It's, it's our children or it's our spouse. It's our, it's our grandchildren. It, it, it's, it, it's our business it's on that ship. And it could be a host of things. And when he, when he, comes, when he comes in upon any of our ships on our armada, we, we need to make sure that, okay, here, here's how we're going to get out of this. We got to use God's word. We have to use God's word. This is what God said. We're the head and not the tail. Just start there. Just start anywhere that comes. We're the head and not the tail above only, not beneath. We're going to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. We're accepting the beloved, so therefore, we will not fear what man will do to us. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Just what, whatever scripture just starts coming out, just use that, and you're going to notice that ship is going to start steering the right direction. For, for what it's worth, I've never been by any means on those type of ships, but obviously, but when the storms would come, they would literally depending on where it was coming from, 
they would, they would pretty much go straight into it. Either straight into it or just off, be it off the starboard or leeward side. And, but still pretty much straight, either straight into it or just to the left or right, but still moving forward into it. And that's what you gotta do. You, you, you see that storm coming, don't run. It'll do more damage. You go right into it. You go into it. You're gonna make it on the other side. You get on that other side, it'll be the most calmest, serene, peaceful waters you've ever been in. Just keep quoting God's word. Stand on God's word. That ship will come in and reach its destination. Amen. Father, we thank you, oh God, that you are the ultimate commander of our life, of the ship that you've blessed us with individually, collectively as husband, wife, collectively as a family unit, collectively as a local church body. We thank you, oh God, that you, that you, that you, God, alone have given us a ship to steer through life and help us to steer it in the right direction that we will use the words of our mouth combined with the meditation of our heart. As it is acceptable in your sight, God, we know that you will confirm your word with signs following. Be it for healing, be it for deliverance, be it for a financial breakthrough, whatever it is, Father, we thank you that as we speak your word, as we stand upon your word, as we sing your word, as we quote your word to a storm, that's raging and it looks like it's gonna pillage us to destruction. Father, we thank you that we're just gonna to continue to look to you and use the words, your word that you've given unto us to speak through every season of life and help us to release the excellency of you, O oh God, from our life through the words that we speak, the actions that we take, the life that we live. May your excellency, Lord, shine forth. May your power resonate, not just in us, but from us to help us and also to help others as we navigate our ship through life. And we bless you and we thank you for your goodness. Bless your people, Father. Bless your people with everything they need, every good gift and every perfect gift. May it be bestowed upon them. Whatever the need is, God, fulfill the need in their life. Whatever the desire is, give them the desire of their heart. Let your goodness this week, this, this holy week, this week of passion, the passion of Christ beginning today until it culminates a week from today on Resurrection Sunday. May this be a holy week to us like never before. May we set portions of the day aside to spend time with you, Lord, thanking you for giving your very self to save us. May we focus our spirit and our soul, our mind, upon you this week like never before in a given year. And we even pray in advance that next week people throughout this nation will come to saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that happen here in this local church, throughout every Bible-believing, Christ-centered church in this city, state, nation, and nations of the world. We pray for a great harvest of souls on Resurrection Sunday, a week from today. And God, may we pray that throughout the week and even spend some time fasting for a wonderful time in your house next week. Bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. We all say amen and amen. God bless you. Love you all. Appreciate being here with you immensely. Have an incredible week. We'll see you next Sunday, and it's going to be a wonderful day. Amen. Elder, God bless you. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.